Thanks. Um, hi, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here to present some of my work. Uh, and I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Uh, my name is Raphael Fourien. Uh, I'm a PhD student with Amandine Weber uh, at Polytechnic and Alison Etheridge at Oxford University. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you about uh, gene flow through geographical barriers. Um, <coughs> What do I mean by geographical barriers is anything that prevents people from moving across. So you can think about mountain ranges, uh, but also if you think of, say, deer or frogs, highways, um, political borders, uh, or also like geographic features like straits and seas and rivers. Um, so I'm not going to talk about any particular species, so you can think of humans, but birds, <coughs> anything. And um, why are we interested in this? Well, we're interested in, in the consequences of these kinds of features on the genetic composition of populations uh, that live on both sides of a barrier. Um, and I'm going to tell you about a very simple model uh, to represent uh, these kinds of situations. So each square here is a population with n individuals uh, living in it. And my mountain range is here, so this is towns in France and towns in Spain, and this is the Pyrenees. Uh, and <coughs> at each generation, I replace every individual in each colony by children of the previous individuals. And the proportion 1 minus m of children in each colony come from are the children of parents from the same colony. And a proportion m of them come from one of the neighboring colonies, except, of course, uh, for these two populations around the barrier, uh, where a proportion half of CM, half of M comes from this population, and half of CM comes from the population that's on the other side of the barrier. So you have to think of C as a very small parameter, something between 0 and 1, and potentially very small. So there's a reduced exchange of migrants between these two populations. <coughs> and I want to know what how the genetic composition of this system evolves in time, generation after generation. And um, this is what it looks like. So suppose I have two types in my population, types 0 and 1. And initially, all the types 1 are on the right, and all the type 0 are on the left. And I let it evolve for some generations. Uh, and the proportion of type 1 in each colony is going to follow this dark line here. So you can see that there's a jump in a proportion of type 1 uh, at the interface. Um, and there's a very nice way to think about this model here is by, instead of thinking of individuals reproducing forwards in time, I think about sampling individuals and looking at where the ancestors lived uh, back in time. So suppose I sample an individual in X and I look at its ancestor t generations ago, and I ask the question, what's the probability that the ancestor of this individual lived to the right of the barrier? Well, this probability is going to be exactly the proportion of type 1 in my population. So this is the equation that's written here. And xi is a random walk on z that's tracing the position of the ancestor of a uniformly sampled individual in my model. So it's very easy to write the transition probabilities of xi. It's exactly the migration uh, rates of the, in this model. So whenever it's in one of the populations here or here, it's doing a simple random walk with uh, jump probability m. And when it's here, it jumps to the right with probability 1, and to the left with prob uh, 1 over 1 plus c, and to the left with probability c over 1 plus c. And the, the goal of biologists studying this, these kinds of models is to try to use genetic data to reconstruct the age of uh, ancestors. Like, say I sample two individuals, uh, I ask what's the age of the most recent common ancestor. And that's giving me some information about the geography uh, uh, of my system. And so for this, we need some formulas to describe what psi t is doing, but since it's a random walk, it's very discreet and we don't have any nice formulas for uh, the law of psi t. So the situation here is 
roughly like this. We have this simple model for how gene uh, type frequencies evolve in time, and we know that we can approximate it with this continuous line here that's solving a partial differential equation that I, I haven't written down. And we have a way of describing this model in terms of a random walk, and we want to describe the continuous version with a continuous process here. <coughs> and that's what I'm going to be telling you about. Um, so take a sequence of random walks, um, each with a different parameter cn, and cn is going to zero. So the bar is getting stronger and stronger as you rescale space and time. I look at uh, the position of my ancestor t generations ago, and I rescale it just as I would rescale a, rond a simple random walk to get standard run in motion. And I suppose that cn is of order something of a square root of n, and this something could be zero, infinite, or something finite in the middle. And in all these cases, I have a convergence of my sequence of processes e xn to some continuous process x, um, <coughs> which is it's essentially a Markov process, but not quite on R, because it doesn't have the same behavior if it comes to zero from the left or if it comes to zero from the right, which is fairly logical given that the random walk doesn't have the same behavior when it's sitting here or when it's sitting here. Um, and so I call this uh, limiting process here partially reflected Brownian motion because we're going to see that it's, it looks like a Brownian motion, but sometimes it's allowed to cross uh, the origin. Um, so I'll give you two constructions of this process and then I'll give you an argument for why the random walk converges to this process. Uh, the first construction is the following. Start with standard Brunnen motion. Draw two lines here. Uh, and essentially we want to keep only the excursions outside of this set. And we want to forget about all this. So I want to forget about all the red bits. I take them out and I join, join all the excursions like this. That gives me a process, and it's obviously not Markov because the behavior at zero depends is a bit weird. But you can make it Markov by s like splitting zero in two states, one that's zero plus and one that's zero minus, and it becomes Markovian. Right, so that's the first construction, and you can see that for a while, if you start from here for a while, it looks like reflected Brownian motion. After some time, it goes, it flips on the other side, and it looks like reflected Brownian motion on the other side, etc., etc. And the second construction makes this more explicit. Um, this time, start with reflected Brownian motion, and I'm going to flip some excursions up and down. And when do I do this? Well, I look at its local time at the origin. That's the red, li the dark line here. And I wait until the local time reaches an ind independent exponential random variable. That's the red line here. And when it reaches this level, when the local time reaches this level, I, fli I change the sign of the process. And then I draw another ro exponential random variable. I wait until the local time reaches this level, and I flip it again, et cetera, et cetera. And the first question that we want to ask is, are these two constructions the same thing? Is this guy the same as this guy? Well, um, the first thing to note is that the local time to the right of zero that this process accumulates is the same as the local time that the original Brownian motion accumulates at this level. And there's a very well-known theorem that's the Raynaud theorem that tells you that the local time that Brownian motion accumulates here before first reaching this point is an exponential random variable with some parameter that depends on the size of this space here. And that's, that allows you to, to say that the, the time at which you have to flip the process is the time when the local time of this process reaches an independent exponential variable. <coughs> right, so why now I've given you a construction of the process and I haven't told you why the random walk converges to this process. Uh, I'm only going to sketch the main steps. The first thing that's fairly clear to see is that the absolute value of the random walk is going to behave like the absolute value of a Brownian motion, because the only weird behavior is jumping from minus 1 to plus 1. 
but the, um, outside of this set is behaving as a simple random walk. So the absolute value is basically, basically the absolute value of a simple random walk. Uh, so the first point is clear. The second point, well, think about how many times the random walk has to visit this point before first going across the barrier and exiting from this side. This is a geometric random variable because of the Markov property. Each time you visit this point, you have some probability of going of exiting from this side and some probability of exiting from th this side. And as we all know, a geometric variable with a very small parameter looks like an exponential random variable. <coughs> and that's what's written here. And then you, you use the Markov property to get some independence. Uh, so the local time accumulated by the random walk between different crossings of the barrier is, uh, is a scaled geometric random variable and so converges to an exponential random variable. And then you have to give some argument for why they're essentially independent in a limit. Um, I won't go into more details. And this is an illustration of this result. So um, the blue dots are the transition probabilities of the original random walk uh, just computed by iterating the transition matrix. And the red line is the transition density of the of partially reflected Brownian motions of the, of the limiting process. We happen to have an explicit formula for this, so it's easy to, to draw. And you can see that the low of xi t is very close to the low of x t. Um, Yes, so <coughs> to sum up, I started with this um, microscopic model uh, character to, to illustrate how genes evolve in time in the presence of a barrier. And I could approximate the evolution of types with this partial, equa partial differential equation. And this random walk gave me a description of this, of the evolution of types in this model, and I can approximate it. I've just shown you this red arrow here, I can approximate it with partially reflected Brownian motion. A natural question is, can I draw the arrow here? And the answer is yes. If I start this process from the point X, uh, I let it evolve from time, and I ask for some time, I ask what's the probability that it's sitting to the right here? Well, this probability <coughs> gives, me a gives me exactly a solution to the partial differential equation that's driving this dark line here. Thank you. So th thanks, uh, Rafael, for this uh, nice talk. Uh, is there any questions? Uh, are there uh, any experiments that uh, kind of confirm uh, the prediction that the uh, so uh, so we we should have a behavior uh, like uh, this uh, partially reflected brown motion. Um, so no one has uh, uh, traced down the ancestry of any individuals in populations and see that so that this isn't a proper behavior. But um, this jump in uh, genetic composition of populations has, has been used and is being used uh, to study different situations uh, for natural populations. <coughs> so this description is very theoretical and this one uh, we know we can use it to caricature what's going on in space. The, the, the main purpose of this is to use these models to do some inference of some demographic parameters in the populations. So we don't really care if what's happening in this model isn't really what's happening in real life. What we want is that essentially the processes look the same, the resulting processes look the same, so that we can sum up what's happening in the real population with some effective parameters in this model. So, uh, is there any other questions? So, you have an, a 
fairly explicit con construction of your process using Ray Knight's formula and yeah. uh, so s certain properties of Brownian motion. Um, can you generalize it to uh, general one-dimensional diffusions? Um, no, I haven't thought about that. Um, I guess you could still do this one uh, for general diffusions. Um, For the construction, but for the convergence, you ask. Well, <clears throat> well, the other so so, so maybe uh, you wouldn't look at uh, you wouldn't look at the process uh, that you obtain by erasing uh, the excursions uh, in in a certain region, yeah. but but still uh, the 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 barrier process uh, directly. Can you oh, define can it kind of directly for a general diffusion? Um. I don't know about the existence. Uh, so this correspondence gives you a characterization of this process as a solution to a martingale problem. Mm -hmm. And you can still write down the martingale problem for a more general process. And um, the proof of this thing uses properties of Brown and motion, but doesn't really use what's happening uh, above and below this set. Uh, so as long as the process behaves as Brownian motion in this set, then I guess you could say something about it. Mm -hmm. But it's an interesting question, yeah. So uh, is there any other questions? So uh, if not, uh, let's thank Florian again.